So far, we departed from Louisville, Kentucky, and after many, many hours, we have finally arrived in Tel Aviv. We cleared customs, collected our baggage, and are now aboard our bus. Now begins our real journey. My name is Anna. I just turned 18, so it's okay. Wow. <laughs> I'm old enough to guide. It was a joke, by the way. <laughs> 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 Our driver's name is Dari, Dari, D-A-R-I, and he is also going to be with us for the next of the trip. And I really hope that you are going to enjoy this amazing pilgrimage. We are going to explore the Holy Land. We are going to, starting from right now, we are going to talk about Jesus Christ. We are going to follow his footsteps all the way to our hotel where we are going to spend check-in for one night in a city that is called Hadera. Very soon I'll put out the map and I'll just pinpoint the different sites that we are going to visit. Um, and I will also, something that we will all have are name tags. Yes, name tags. You will all also receive maps, the same maps that you will see me hanging and explaining about. And I really like explaining using the map. This is how you can learn the topography of the Holy Land and really feel it. You do not just see it, you really feel it and understand why a lot of the times, because it is the pilgrimage that follows the stories of the Bible. So you will understand a lot of the times why the Bible says going up or going down or going up or going down. You are going to see all of the valleys and those high hills or the mountains with your own eyes. about this part of the whole world in the biblical research we call it the cradle of civilization I do not have the time right now to show it in the map but I want you already to imagine it that the first settlements the first empires that were created all around the world were in this area we have ancient Egypt that was on the western side of the Holy Land what we call today this part of the Holy Land and on the eastern side there were different um, different empires that succeeded or conquered each other. We had the kingdom of Shumer, 
we have also the Mitannis or what you call them uh, the Mitanni um, and in other kinds of the Canaanites, uh, the Canaanite nation. Later on we had the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Parthians and so on and so on and so on. These were the different kingdoms that ruled in the area which is today Iran, Iraq. And those ancient Egypt and what we call the, what we call the lands where today Iran, Iraq is, they were constantly in a fight from the dawn of humanity, basically. And where were they carrying all of those battles, most of the battles? Right here. So already from the beginning of the, I would call, of that, of the dawn of humanity, we had here different settlements that were sometimes overpowered by the Egyptians and sometimes were overpowered by either Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and so on and so on, until 332 BC, when Alexander the Great sails across the Mediterranean Sea, conquers this whole land and reaches up until India. Yes, that will be the beginning of the Greek period. Now, it's very important to understand Caesarea in, it, in all of it, because Caesarea by the sea did not really exist as a big port city until the Roman period. In the Roman period, when the Romans conquered this land, it happened in year 63 BC. Later on, in year 44 BC, there will be a whole turmoil because of Julius Caesar that will be killed in Rome. Later on, there will be a minor civil war that will continue with something that we call the allegiance of the three heads of the Roman Empire. After all of that, there will be the first Roman Emperor will be appointed and that will be Caesar Augustus. Now during that time, between year 39 to 37 BC, are you following me? There was also a civil war right here in this land and at the end of that civil war, one very important person will conquer all of this land and his name will be Herod. And the rest of the story we are going to continue talking about it inside Caesarea by the Sea. Caesarea by the Sea. Exploring this place, I am impressed by the size of the facility and the technology used, considering this was built 2,000 plus years ago. They built an artificial harbor. They brought water from a spring 16 kilometers away via raised aqueduct. The aqueducts built for Caesarea supplied the city with water for over 1,200 years. They built a 10,000 seat chariot racing facility. They had a theater, a large palace for King Herod, I find it fascinating that a lot of these structures still remain today after 2,000 plus years. Contrast these facilities with modern built structures that are torn down only after 100 years. Add on the spiritual significance of this place and it's well worth a visit. Cornelius has a dream. This is God that initiates it here. So I'm hoping that God will initiate something in you here today. This is the place where Gentiles are going to get to come into the kingdom of the Lord as, as we know it. And so this, he has a dream. It's found in Acts chapter 10. I don't, I don't know that we have to read it all. I can just tell it to you, okay? And in Acts chapter 10, uh, he has this dream, and he sees in the dream that he's supposed to send for a guy named Simon uh, at Simon's the Tanner's house, and his name is Simon Peter. And it's up in Joppa, where we were last night. We were driving through it, so it's not very far from here. Uh, so he sends for this man, and he has words of the Lord yeah. that he needs to hear. What about Cornelius? The Bible says, he's a Roman, but he, the Bible says he was a devout man who gave alms yeah. to the church. He yeah. loved God's kingdom. He just didn't know all about Jesus yet. Right. Yeah. You know, there's people right. out there that do good things. Right. They just don't know about the Lord. They don't know about it. They're trying to be a good person. And that's our job to let them know why they're being a good person because Jesus wants to give you a better life. Mm -hmm. And so he, he sends for them. He can't leave here. They go up and get, and they're knocking at the door. That's when I was teasing Anna yesterday about um, the Bible said he went up on the rooftop because it's cooler and he's relaxing up there because the meal was late. <laughs> <laughs> the meal was late. Right. So a late meal uh, opens the door to a whole Christian world. Yeah. So praise God for that. Yeah. Yeah.
not for the late meal, but <laughs> And so they knock at the door, and I don't know, I've heard people preach that it's a picture of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, there's three men, I, I don't know, that's kind of a reach, I think, but, but nevertheless, there's three men, and they want him to come here. Well, he's Jewish. They say at Jaffa, they don't come here. Yeah. This is a Roman city, like she's so happy. By the way, yeah. we need to give her a nice one. She's a Roman city. Guys that weren't so bright. <laughs> I'd say that, but <laughs> nevertheless. You need to tell me all about it. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you about it. <laughs> but they come here and they, they find him, and the Bible says he had his kinsmen, his relatives, his neighbors. He had everybody he could waiting on Apostle Peter to come here. And Apostle Peter said, Well, the first thing he tells him is, you know, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not supposed to be in a Roman house. I, I could be in big trouble, and he will get in trouble over this. Up at Jerusalem, they're going to have a big a conference and say, what were you doing down there with those people? Mm -hmm. You know, you still have that problem with uh, ignorant people, <laughs> uh, not knowing what God's doing. But nevertheless, uh, he comes here, and he begins to share about Jesus. And I, I just want to read that part of it, okay? It's in Acts 10. My memory says verse 34. I think it's right in there somewhere. Then Peter opened his mouth and said of the truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Because here he is now, finding somebody that loves God. Yes. Yeah. And they're yes. not Jewish. <laughs> and he start, he's startled by that. And they're no respecter of persons. But in every nation, he that heareth or feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Praise God. And the word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is the Lord of all. And that word I say, you know, which was publicized throughout all Judea. You know it here. Uh, Pilate keeps his troops here. He has a meager amount of troops up in Jerusalem. But they don't go there unless it's a feast day because you don't want to shove Roman power in the face of people. You know, if there's a problem, they send them. They send them from here, up to Jerusalem. So the real Roman strength is here, not in Jerusalem. But on a feast day like the Passover, you've got the fortress of San Antonio, which we will uh, see, where they would watch over, and you'd have a hundred thousand Jewish men uh, at the Passover. Well, that could be a problem if a riot breaks out. So this is kind of where the authority comes from. And when I was a kid, which was what? Right after the Civil War, <laughs> been a long time ago. Uh, people, when I was in school, uh, they, I had Dr. McCown, who was my teacher, and he said there's no evidence that there was even a man named Pilate. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't. At that time, there was no evidence. And so people said, well, it's just made up, that story of Christianity. But here, will we see that? We, we will see. We'll get to see a stone yes. that has Pilate's we name see, on it mm -hmm. that they dug up. So praise the Lord. Yeah. I think the Bible yeah. says very clearly, yeah. let every man be a liar and God be true. Yeah. Amen. You know, it's, it's not, that, it's the not the truth, it's just the that we haven't found it yet. Uh, and then and I love one other section here in New World. When Peter yet spake these words, he's telling them about Jesus. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Yes. Yeah. You are standing. You, one of the few people from the United States, are right here. I'm not right speaking tongues. This is where the Holy Ghost fell on people that didn't have any idea about it. They didn't know about that. And suddenly, while they're telling about Jesus, I have learned as a pastor, if you want the Holy Spirit to fall on people, you preach Jesus. Amen. If you preach about the Holy Ghost, nothing happens. But you preach Jesus. And right here is where people that are out on, who are those people on the boats? They're slaves, soldiers, and when they come up, they go, hey, what's the word here? What's happening here? Then they want to know what's going on. You're about Jesus. Let me tell you about Jesus. And Cornelius comes up and says, I was praying, and boy, yeah. you can get blessed and touch and God. God has a place for you. You don't have to die in this boat and just die here, and that'll be the end of your life. There's a heaven. And there's a place, you see, this This goes over here. And then it starts spreading from here. Remember, Paul's going to catch a boat from here and head for Rome. And the uh, ship's not going to be, you know, it's going to be in trouble uh, out there on the sea. But this, this is the beginning of a great place right here. So I want you to do something this morning as we close this little part right here. You've got to feel. 
what happened here. You just can't take pictures of rocks. So today, let's just take a moment here right now and just ask the Lord to fill us with the Holy Spirit. That the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead up at Jerusalem will dwell in us and quicken our mortal bodies. And that the presence of God on, on, on this trip, this is one of my favorite places is right here. And when we'll travel around here a little bit, you'll see the Crusader forts and how Christians marched all the way, or by boat, all the way from Europe to try to redeem and bring back the Christian sites and the Crusades. And to think that the Lord loved Gentiles, which is me, enough that he would bring that gospel to us right here and then ship it across the uh, place. I can just imagine uh, you're rowing the boat, you're slave, and some guy sitting to you, you heard about Galilee? You heard about Jesus? I was at Caesarea. What'd you find out there? Well, man, they got some guy who says he rose yeah. from the dead. You know, and that just is going to spread like wildfire. And in 300 years, that's all it takes. 300 years, and the whole Roman Empire has turned into Christianity. Those people shared the good news Amen. of Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I just want to share a few things with you at different places just so that you get some spiritual impact. And if you have any questions, just don't, you know, don't hesitate. Just ask Alan any time you want. <laughs> He's been here as many times as I have. was also for the Gentiles. When we are talking about Abraham, when we are talking about the three children, when we are talking about the immersion of what will become later on the chosen people, they were all Canaanites. They were colonized, they were all worshipping different deities, and God chose them to give them the first covenant. And we are going to talk about it again. I want you to remember that. Come, let us go over there. Try to imagine this. Why is this thing
mentioned him. This very, very important moment when God redeems the people of Israel and chooses Elijah as the prophet that he's going to do it through him happened right here in this mountain. Mount Carmel is roughly in altitude, roughly 17, 90 feet high. And on top of this mountain ridge, there is actually a biosphere reserve, a UNESCO biosphere reserve, roughly 31,000 acres of natural forest. Look at all of Israel. That takes me back to Israel to the map. Half of Israel is desert. All of this part that we call the Negev, the southern part, is all desert. We have additional desert, also what we will call and we will pass by the Judean mountains, the Judean desert, or the wilderness. You heard about the wilderness? Yes, the important wilderness. This is something that is located right over here. Now, all of the area of the Samaritan mountains and the Judean mountains, that as I said yesterday, the mountain range that goes that follows, it's like a spine of Israel from north to south. Jerusalem is right in the middle of it. The Samaritan mountains, the Judean mountains, the Samaritan mountains are named after this very, very important capital that was once the capital of this ancient kingdom, kingdom of Israel that I just talked to you about. Yes, King Ahab was the king of this kingdom. It was located right over here. Now today, there are, if you go along the Israeli side of these mountains, you can see that there are a lot of forests, but all of those forests are actually planted by the Jewish National Fund. Most of the forests that you are going to see, even when we go along this area, the Galilee, by the way, that we are going to go through, the Galilee, where Jesus had carried his ministry, Nazareth and Cana and all of that, this is the region of the north. You can see that it's far away from Jerusalem, far away from the bustling center of the country. This is the Galilee. Even in the Galilee, we can see today that there are many forests and many trees that were actually planted by the Jewish National Fund. In any case, so many trees that you see around the Holy Land were actually planted by somebody. The only place where you can see natural growing forests is right here, ladies and gentlemen, on top of this mountain. And this is why UNESCO decided to name it a biosphere reserve, 31,000 acres of biosphere reserve. It's a huge mountain range. This is the only place today that we can still see some indigenous life, like wild boars, porcupines, different types of wild dogs, like for example foxes, or sometimes you can even see jackals, different types of birds, different types of serpents, uh, they say that until 1,000 years ago, you can even see bears and lions roaming around this forest. But they were all hunted down thanks to the crusaders. <laughs> yes, they had, they had to eat something. Now, what is very interesting that this mountain, the mountain, the origin of the name, actually, um, the origin of the name, sh uh, the origin of the name Carmel. Carmel, Keremel. Carmel comes from the word Keremel which means the vineyard of God. A vineyard is a type of a garden. When we are talking about a garden in the biblical context, usually we will talk about a place where people will cultivate something, correct? Usually in this type of garden, you will see some kind of a press, maybe an olive oil press, yes? Maybe we'll talk about it later, like Gethsemane, for example, that was also a garden. You remember that Jesus, when he was buried, there was a garden? Yes, you remember that? So the same context with the garden is something that also is applied right here in Mount Carmel, a place which is very, very fertile. The land is fertile and the land is good for cultivation already from the biblical time. Today, Mount Carmel is very famous for its vineyards. There are dozens of vineyards that are based all over this mountain, right over here, and we are passing some by, you'll see on the way right now, on the right-hand side, you'll see some of the famous vineyards. Vineyards and citrus trees that also grow in this area. Olives, abundance of olives, so it's a very, very fertile, fertile area. And literally, it is hidden in the name of this mountain, the Vineyard of God, okay? Now, this mountain right here, was allotted to the tribe of Menashe more than 3,000 years ago. Menashe, yes, Menashe, sorry. Menashe is in Hebrew, Menashe, Menashe is in your language, in English, in your language. 
Menasse. But we know that when the different tribes, the 12 tribes settled down in here, roughly 3,000, 3,200 years ago, at the time of Joshua, son of Nun, they were not able to fulfill the conquering of this land. Only at the time of Solomon, they were able to, all of the tribes were able to completely full, conquer the whole land, including the tribe of Menasseh. So this whole area specifically that we are passing by was allotted to this tribe, and this tribe later on settled down in here. Now, the same tribe, continue to hold on to settle down to live in this area also after the division of the United Kingdom so when we are talking about King Ahab during his time Menashe will settle down in here but that will be already the part of the northern kingdom kingdom of Ahab are you following me on the map it is somewhere right over here now you remember that Ahab if you follow the story of King Swan Kings 1 starting from chapter 17 all through chapter 18 all through the end of the book we talk about the ministry of Elijah Elijah that came from the land of Gilead that is beyond the Jordan River look at what I'm going to explain to you right now the Galilee region where Jesus had started his ministry is right over here the Sea of Galilee it's right over here the only fresh body of water that we have. The Dead Sea, the lowest shores, the lowest point, driest point in the whole world is the Dead Sea, the salty body of water. Dead Sea is right over here. The Mediterranean Sea that a lot of the times was called either the Big Sea or the Sea at the back. Caesarea by the Sea, Jaffa are all on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Yes, Mount Carmel is right over here. All of this strap of land, this is what we call the coastland region, because all of, the, all of the land is flat. And on the other side, there are the mountains. On the other side of the mountains of Samaria and Judea, there is another valley, a very, very, very important valley. Ladies and gentlemen, Jordan River. The Jordan River is the boundary, the biblical boundary of this land. When you go in or go out from the Promised Land, you need to dip your feet in the waters of the Jordan River. The Jordan, in the Old Testament, is not called the Jordan River. They call it the Jordan. In Hebrew, Yarden. Yarden means flowing down. Look at what I'm explaining to you right now. Mount Hermon is the highest peak in this whole land, roughly 7,500 feet. 10 Seven percent of it, sorry, is right here, is in Israel. This is, by the way, the Golan Heights that we are going to visit tomorrow. So Syria is right over here, Golan Heights here, Lebanon here, Jordan, the Kingdom of Jordan, and the um, Egypt, the country of Egypt, yes. The Jordan River starts to flow from the foot of Mount Hermon all the way down south through the Sea of Galilee. Most of the Sea of Galilee is being fed by the Jordan River, and then it continues to flow all the way down to the Dead Sea, to the Dead Sea. So all of this, this distance is somewhere around 130 miles that the Jordan does from the foot of Mount Hermon across the Sea of Galilee and all the way down, 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 down to the Dead Sea. Flows all the way down to the Dead Sea. Elijah. When Elijah, in Kings 1, chapter 17, he was summoned by God to start his ministry, he was in the land right here that we call Gilead. What was the hometown of Elijah? What was the title of Elijah? Elijah the? The prophet. <laughs> Elijah the Tishbi. The Tishbi. Tishbite. You remember Tishbite? Tishbi was a town that was on the eastern side of the Jordan River, Tishbi was in the land of the Gilead. The mountains of Gilead in the map are located right here, but today it's, it's the, in the kingdom of Jordan, in the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, or the country of Jordan. Elijah had to cross the Jordan River to begin his ministry, but God told him before you will start your ministry, before, before you will get to the point why I have summoned you and you'll redeem the people of Israel, you um, you will wait you will wait until i will summon you you have to wait now during that time i'll go back i'll go back to the kingdom of israel it was a very very dark 
period of time for the inhabitants of the kingdom of Israel because their king married to a Sidonite princess. Sidonite Sidon was another port city in modern day Lebanon. He married a Sidonite princess, her name was Jezebel. Jezebel, when she married Ahab, she decided to kill a lot of the prophets of the one God and to introduce her own, uh, her own pagan religion in forcing all of the people to start worshiping her God, the Baal and Asherah. The Asherah was a pagan, a very, very old Canaanite deity of fertility. And the Baal, literally the Baal, was the rain and the thunderstorm god. When we go back to the Canaanite, what do you call it, the, the Canaanite theology or pantheon, the one god, the El, was actually the head of this pantheon, and there were other deities. One of the other deities was also uh, Baal, which was the god of rain and thunderstorm. Now at some point, the people decided to stop praying for this one god, the El, and they will start praying for Baal, because Baal will actually provide them with everything that they need. On the other hand, the Israelites later on, they will worship only the El. How do you say the God, God in Hebrew? Elohim. So literally in Hebrew, El means God, refers to the one God. But originally, as I said, when we were sitting back there in Caesarea, it all has some local Canaanite roots, the name, of course, the name itself. So originally the El was worshiped as one of the many deities that the people here had worshiped. And even Abraham at his time, he also knew about those different deities. Baal, on the other hand, he was the reign of thunderstorm and rain a lot of the times people will pray to Baal when they will want their crops of wheat and barley, like what you see right now, maybe on the left, on the right side, when they will want their God of rain to pour on water on their, on their crops so they will be able to grow, they will worship the God of rain, Baal. Now, I will tell you even more than this, there is a biblical way of cultivation that is called the Baal cultivation. The Baal cultivation is a type of cultivation where you grow crops in a flat land and those crops crops will only depend on the rainwater, which means that you do not need to use any irrigation system. No, any irrigation system. Yes, the Baal cultivation is something, what, what would you usually grow uh, in this Baal cultivation? Corn, wheat and barley until today when you will go and see the different fields and see the different you'll go and see the different fields in the galilee and so on you'll see fields of grain fields of corn fields of wheat and fields of barley and until today the state of israel does not know that the farmers does not do not need to use irrigation because these crops basically depend only from the rainfall water this is this is something for you very very important to understand so naturally that was the basic food of the people in this land and the people would worship their god that was also called Baal to provide them with water in this Baal cultivation. Yes? Are you, do you understand? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Later on people will develop different types of cultivation. They will take the slopes of the mountain, they will create balconies and they will be able to bring water to those specific terraces. This will be called the different types of cultivation, a cultivation that in Hebrew we call shalchim, or just the terraces cultivation that will be used some kind of an irrigation, yes. But this is very important for you to understand because ladies and gentlemen, when you are a Canaanite or an Israelite or a Sidonite and you live here 3,000 years ago, your food depends on your relation with the deities. This is how important it is. So if you are a good farmer, you would pray to the God of Baal. If you are an extremely good Israelite farmer, you will not need to pray to the Baal. But you see, this is what the Jezebel had done with the Ahab. They actually had killed many of the prophets of the one God and actually enforced this pagan religion back on the people that dwelt in this land. And then something very important happened, and this will be already the story that we will read in Kings 1, chapter 18, how Elijah, that was, by the way, persecuted, and was uh, persecuted by Jezebel and by Ahab, 
He hid in the cave. He was fed by the ravens. They gave him meat. They gave him bread also. If you remember, he would eat locusts. Locusts, it's not a fruit. It's actually the insects. And by the way, locusts or some grasshoppers, the similar to grasshoppers, this is the only kosher insect that you can eat. Today. Kosher. Just so you know that the Jews uh, are allowed uh, to eat, but I do not know many Jews who eat them. <laughs> also, date honey, by the way. Date honey, the land that flows with milk and honey. Do you, do you really think that it's a bee honey? Yep. It's date honey. It's date honey. So when you are going to visit different places, yes, you want to taste the date honey because Israel and the whole land is very famous for its date honey. And we know for a fact that when the Bible talks about somebody eating a honey, it is a date honey, not a bee honey. Because dates, you'll see that it's another type of a crop or a crops that grow here in abundance, especially in the wilderness. Okay, so let's just finish the story with Elijah. We are going to read about this very important moment that God brings Elijah to this mountain, which we already climb up on top. We are actually driving right now on top of Mount Carmel. We are going to reach with you to a Roman Catholic church, which means that you need to make sure that your shoulders and knees will be covered in the last side. I don't think that we have any problem like this today. It's a little bit breezy. Olive trees on the right side, olive trees. And we are going to tell the important story of how God redeemed the people of Israel, opened their eyes with the acts of Elijah, when Elijah had summoned the Baal, remember the Baal? Yes. And the Asherah prophets. He summoned them and he competed against them. And right at the end of this battle, of this competition, the people, the eyes of the people were opened because uh, the people of the eyes were, of the eyes of the people were opened and the um, and they were redeemed again for at least for some time in any case i do not want to to tell it to you right now because i want you to tell it also in the in the panoramic view so you'll be able to imagine it i do want to add on the other thing that when elijah had actually finished his ministry do you remember what happened to elijah how did he disappear from the world a chariot, a fiery chariot. He went up the whirlwind. But what happened before that? He crossed the Jordan River. He exited the Jordan River and then he went out. And this is why it's a preparation for you because we are going to visit. I hope we'll have the time to visit the Jordan River either tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but we'll discuss it. Um, the Jordan River is the gate. Is the gate. It's the border but it's also the game. If you want to go into the promised land and start your ministry, you need to cross the Jordan River. If you want to, if you want to leave the promised land and go up to heaven, you need to cross the Jordan River. The Jordan River is very crucial. This is why Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, because it was the gateway for the new life, for the fulfillment of the promise of the Lord. This is how I connect it to you. And, and exactly, exactly. So we are going to talk about it because I want you to understand that before the time of Jesus, at the time of David and the time of Solomon, the Jewish religion or the Israelite religion was a centralized religion that depended, depended on Jerusalem. You can only ask for repentance of sins inside Jerusalem. And this is how it was at the time of David and at the time of Solomon, where the Ark of Covenant was placed right there on Mount Moriah. But some, in some point in history, 2,000 years ago, something very bad goes into Jerusalem. When Jesus walks in the hills of the Galilee and he teaches them in parables about the wheat and about the barley and about the grains and about the mustards and about the olives and the fig tree and all of that, he does it away from Jerusalem and not only him, we know that from the other side, from Josephus Flavius, there are uh, other accounts of a huge turmoil, political conflict that is going on into Jerusalem. And just think that John the Baptist, who was from a priestly division, goes up to a highest, to the highest mountain and leaves Jerusalem, this holy city. The religion is based on Jerusalem. He lives to the wilderness and goes to the Jordan River where he says the repentance of sins will be given to you if you wash yourself in the Jordan River. This is the gates to 
the fulfillment of the promise. Literally. Yes, just think about it. But of course, we'll talk about it also tomorrow. There's so many things that we want to say. So many things, so little time. ...that a top of a mountain has been hit by fire. Well, that's unusual. Uh, you don't find too many mountains that have been hit by fire. So uh, up here is a very sacred spot. And of course, uh, as we heard so again, so beautifully from our guide that the prophets of Baal are the thunderstorm rain. So he's challenging, Elijah is challenging uh, the God of thunder and rain because there hadn't been any rain. Remember, Elijah shut the heavens up and so it hadn't rained. So here's a man that walked with God so much that he could open the heavens and let it rain and, and shut it up. And so he, his name, Elijah, or El Yah, so you have the God of the great I Am, is challenging, how did you say that, Baal or Baal? Baal. Baal, yes. okay. Or Baal. Or Baal? In your language, it's Baal. Baal. Yeah. Baal. In your language, it's Baal. I okay. guess. So he rallied everybody here. I think one of the great things uh, uh, to understand here is how do you get fire to fall from heaven? If you want an answer from God, what do you do? Uh, here's the answer. It's right here. He, re he rebuilt the altar. He rebuilt it. And he let them go first. And remember how they jump on the top of their altar and they cut themselves with knives and they screamed and they hollered and they wanted God to come down and send fire, and of course, uh, he didn't answer him, and, and Elijah made fun of him. Yeah, he, he, he poked him a little bit, didn't he? he? He said, well, maybe they're asleep, your God's asleep, you just need to holler a little louder. <laughs> and traveling. Yeah, maybe he's gone off on a journey, and he'll be back soon, you know, things like that. And every few hours, he'd just throw it up. Maybe he's asleep. <laughs> yeah, he's wake him up or something. And then it finally came his turn, and he did something that I think is so beautiful about our personal lives. What was the scarcity? Water. What's the first thing he did? He took the most precious things, water, and he poured it on the altar. He's pouring on the altar what he wanted more of. So when we need a miracle from the Lord, sometimes it's better to give what a little bit you have so that more will come your way. Isn't that great? And so he put water so that he knew the fire was coming. Woo, that's really good. <laughs> he knew the fire was coming. So he went ahead and said, just so you know that I don't have a little flame Bunsen burner down in here somewhere that's going to kick on and get all this going. I'm going to put water all on. Do you remember how many times? Three times. A lot. Tells about how many gallons and gallons of water he pours on there. And then he begins to uh, cry out to the Lord and to call on the Lord. And he has such a great life that he's lived for the Lord that God hears him. And the fire falls and consumes. And here's a, one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. It says, when the fire of God fell, it licked up the water in the trench. Well, when you lick something up, it means you really like it. I, I've seen some of you eat gelato ice cream. <laughs> Not a pretty sign. And, uh, but it was God saying, what you sacrificed, what you gave, is so pleasing to me, I'm going to lick that up. Isn't that beautiful? That's beautiful. And the fire fell, but no rain. We got fire, but we don't have any rain. Fire was the opposite of rain. It's the opposite. So he goes somewhere here, somewhere here, and puts his head down between his knees, the Bible said, and begins to pray. And here you have two views. You have the great Armageddon and the Valley of Jezreel, and then you have the Mediterranean. And he looks out towards the Mediterranean because that's uh, from the west. It's coming towards the east. Uh, that's where the weather uh, climate should come. The rain should come, and he doesn't see anything. And remember, he has his servant. He didn't want to lose the posture of prayer by getting up himself. He could have got up and looked for the, the rain, but he was in prayer. I remember when Bill Branham, when I was a young man, Bill Branham, I was like 10 or 11, and he was, uh, people were getting healed all over the United States through his ministry, and he would not, uh, he didn't like to pray for people. He came out already prayed up. And he would just touch people and just touch them and say, in Jesus' name, and keep going. 
you know, keep going. He, he, would, he was already praying. But he would say, don't talk to me when I'm praying. Because my one hand is going to be in God's hand, and the other hand is going to be on you. And if you talk to me, I will lose grip somewhere. And we won't get the blessing or the, what you need. So I thought that was neat. And Elijah does not want to get up and go look. So he tells a servant to go look. Now, how many times do you go look? Yeah, he, he went seven times, which is God's perfect number. How many times did uh, Naaman dip? Seven times. How many times are they going to walk around the walls of Jericho? Seven times. How many times are you going to eat lunch today? <laughs> Just once, Anna. I'm sorry to get him, okay? Uh, but that's God's perfect number. You know, one is unity. Two is something's always being divided, like Cain and Abel, some friction. Three is uh, something new's coming. Resurrection in three days. Four is the number of the earth, north, south, east, west. Five is grace. You're surrounded by grace. You got five toes. You got five fingers. Uh, you have five senses. Uh, this is all part of the grace of God that you were created with. Uh, six is man's number. Antichrist has come in his number. Not his name. His number will be six, six, six. The number of Jesus in Greek, if you add up the name Jesus, Jesus in Greek, it's eight, eight, eight. Seven is a perfect number. Eight is a new beginning. Whenever, how many people are in uh, the ark? With Noah, there's eight people inside the ark because they're going to have a new beginning. Nine are the promises of God. You know, nine gifts of the Spirit, nine fruits of the Spirit. This is all part of, of God's, that's called the study of gematria, or the study of numbers. I got a book that's going to come out in about three months. Uh, I, I think right now we're trying to call it The Dreamer Cometh. Uh, I've written all about dreams and visions that have really changed my life and how uh, in Genesis, there are ten dreams in Genesis that I use to make this book, you know, it's the outline of it, uh, that changed the world. Ten dreams in the book of Genesis that changed the world. And they pretty well come to all ministers. These dreams come to all of us. I'll just give you one. I'm not going to give you all because you can buy the book. Uh, <laughs> number one is the uh, warning dream. The warning dream comes first. And it came to uh, uh, a king and told him, don't marry Sarah now. Don't marry Sarah. And remember Abraham, the father of the faithful, the great man of God? He lied. He said, that's not my wife, that's my sister. Because he thought that king would kill him. And so he said, that's my sister. And God had to go to that king and say, don't touch her because she's going to be the vessel to the whole generation of the Jewish nation. So we don't want her uh, to be defiled by you. And so the king gets really upset with Abraham because he lied to him. Later, Abraham will do the same thing again, which means he never got that resolved. He never, sometimes when we commit sins or we make a mistake, we need to resolve that with the Lord. We need to resolve that with people. He did and he comes back and does it again. Uh, I think that's a picture of what I tried to write in that chapter is you got to move on and you got to get healing for that and then move on so that it doesn't come back up because if the devil knows what hurts you or how he can, uh, he'll, come, he'll bring it back, bring it back to you. How many times do you go? Well, you go until you get an answer. You say, well, I've prayed about that. I didn't get an answer. Well, go again. Go again. Maybe you're on six. Maybe you're on five and you got two more to go and you don't know it. But get those two done because then you'll get to seven. Um, he got to that perfection and the servant came back and he didn't have really good answered Eddie. He said, I see a cloud, but it's just the size of a man's hand. So as he looked out, he saw this little puff of white right out there. Right out there. And he said, he gets, I love this faith of this man. He said, tell Ahab, get in his chariot and get down off this mountain now. Because I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. Why wow, he didn't hear it out of that little cloud. He heard it in, in his spirit. He heard it in his prayer. He knew that something was coming. He could hear. And, and I think good Christians can hear uh, God coming before he ever gets there. Leaders see things. Uh, oh, we got a guy here who can tell us that. John Maxwell brings that out. That's one of his points. Leaders see things uh, before other people see them. And they see them bigger before other people see them. And he saw this big thing coming. And he begins to, 
Ahab's going down the mountain. I'm, Ahab's got to go down and Cherry goes around and around like this. It's going to take him a while. And Elijah, the Bible says he girds up his, his uh, loins or he wraps up his clothes so he can run. And then he begins to run and he runs down this mountain while Ahab's in the chariot and he outruns him. Now, I, I think there's a good lesson there. Uh, is that's the Valley of Armageddon. That's the end. What should we be doing as the end approaches? Well, the world's going to be winding its way down. You following that? Ahab, Jezebel, they're winding their way down. But the people of God are not going to be crying and fussing and, oh, in the world. They're going to run towards the valley. Woo, they're going to run towards the valley. And I think it's a valley, but uh, if we have God, we're going to be all right. And this is the God that answers by fire. Wow. But then sends the rain. Because what was the problem? One more time. The land was, yeah, it was a drought. The crops were dying. So the importance was not the fire. Now, if you weren't on this mountain and you're down in that valley, you can still see this fire. You can still see the fire. If you're on this side and you see the fire fall, you can still see the fire. Praise God. You can still see the fire. But when the rain comes, we all feel the rain. And when that rain started coming on those crops that she so aptly uh, pictured that the economy, these people were so dependent, that's their life, and they couldn't get that rain. But if you've ever prayed for something and you needed the rain to fall, yeah, and the rain starts coming, and you hear the thunder and lightning, you'll get blessed because you know a miracle is on its way. If you need a miracle, I'm going to pray for you right now. If there's something in your life that you've been saying, well, whew, I don't know how to get an answer to that. Build the altar again. Rebuild the altar. Do that again. Put something on it. Sometimes people say, well, put money on it. Uh, you, know, you can do that if you want. Or you can just uh, give it to Anna. She would appreciate that. <laughs> Sac there you go, preacher. I just say you have to yeah. sacrifice something. It doesn't have to be money. It could be your time. It could Absolutely. be whatever it Talent, is, but you have to sacrifice treasure. something. And then the other, other thing that I would add is that after the fire fell, then what did they do? They rejoiced and they said, mm. they honored the Lord and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The whole company of people yes. led by Elijah all repeated that yeah. because I think sometimes we can forget to do that. Like we can pray for something and, and then the Lord will answer our prayer and then all of a sudden, then we forget that God is the one that answered the prayer. And so I think it's always important that when God does do what he says he's going to do and he's faithful and just to do exactly what he said he'd do, is that we have to remember to, to show respect and honor to the Lord and thank him and say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And we're doing that to show that we love him and we appreciate all the things that he's doing in our lives every single day. I think we could end every day of our lives by saying, before we lay our heads down to, on a pillow and say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, because every day he's great and mighty and does the things that we so many things we ask for and so many things he's doing for us that we don't even ask for. It's the same, but he's proving his, his power uh, here by the fire. That's what I love about this place. Mm -hmm. okay, so Lord Jesus, we just close our eyes on this great mountain. But in our hearts, oh, I hear that Israeli jet out there in that valley. <laughs> Praise God. It's either going to land and disappear in that base that's down there or it's going to roar over us. I thank you, God, for all the prayers. Mm -hmm that people have brought on this trip. I had people that came to me. Oh, wow. Come on. Come on with that. Everybody say praise the Lord. Remember my home. Remember my children. Remember my personal life. Remember me over there and call, call my name out. So to all of you today, on the God, on the mountain where the God answers by fire, I pray that you will get a moment on this trip where God will answer you, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but somewhere in this trip, you will find what you've been looking for. 
and God will restore, renew, rejuvenate, reinvigor. It will bring the power of God back into your life and give you purpose for your life. Oh, I just praise you. Let's just raise our hands right here. Uh, it's just a beautiful day. Oh, we thank you, Lord, bringing the sun out a little bit, but we appreciate that cloud cover just keeping us from uh, burning up up here with that fire. I just pray, God, that every tourist doesn't take a rock off this mountain and reduce it to a valley. Just let us just take what we take from here, that it be spiritual, and that we'll say, oh, I got some on Mount Carmel, and I filled my pockets with, and it was a great moment, and I stuffed it in my life, and in my mind, and in my spirit, and in my heart. And when I walked away, I walked away with the spirit of Elijah, who was not afraid to take on an Ahab and a Jezebel and stand up for God. Give us more people like that, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. Praise amen. the Lord. Amen. Amen. Praise God. See how great is our God. Then go into that. Then sings my soul. Then sings my soul. How great thou art. My Savior. God. How great thou art. How great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, to thee. How Just clap our hands to the Lord. Just pray the Lord. The Jezreel Valley. Looking at this valley, I am struck by how beautiful it is and how fertile and strategically important it is. This valley is a crossroads for people and goods flowing between different regions and countries. Therefore, it is not surprising that this valley has a long history of battles. This valley is where the Battle of Armageddon will likely take place. Right here, at the same spot, when you emerge from this foothills of Mount Carmel and get into the Jezreel Valley, this is where Megiddo is. Remember what I'm going to tell you <laughs> next. Big cities, biblical cities, were built over intersection of important highways. We have Megiddo, we have Hazor, we have Beth Shean, we have Jericho. Those are big cities that already existed before the time of Israel. For example, this whole mound right here, which are the remains of the biblical Megiddo, goes back to 5,000 years ago of settlement that existed right here at the spot, at the intersection of the Via Maris and the Jezreel Valley. This is how important it is, which means that the same merchants the same people that will come with bearing different cultures, sharing different religions, they would go along these highways. They will spread good news, bad news, good food, bad food. And a time of war between Egypt and between those kingdoms, they will be fighting along this valley, along the coastline valley and along the same highways. <coughs> Until today, there is a very big intersection on that side of the Tel that connects the people with the north with the people that come from Tel Aviv and the central part of the country. So until today, the same highways, the same valleys serve the same purpose and it is still a very, very big, important intersection. So during the rush hour, expect to have a huge traffic jam, even <laughs> until today. But besides that, you can see how fertile the valley of Israel is. Naturally, this will be the food sources of the people of Megiddo and this is why it will become a very important city-state or a very important tax collecting city later on. Finally, around the 7th century, around the 7th century, 
7th century AD, around the, sorry, 8th century AD, we have the king, the king Josea. Have you, you remember the king Josea? Yes? King Josea was one of the good kings that reigned in Judah. He was a reformator king, reformer king. He abolished a lot of the pagan high places and introduced back the worship of the one God. For some unknown reason, he decides to go against the word of the Lord. He goes out of Jerusalem to intercept the army of Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh Necho, that is on the way to something totally different, to, to fight against the Assyrians. He meets this king, meets the army, that is this king that is remiss, that is so highly regarded in the Bible, beats the Pharaoh Necho right here in the spot of Megiddo. And because he went against the word of the Lord, he is killed right here at this spot in Megiddo. So we are going to visit right now Nazareth. Nazareth today is a very important city. Today it's the Arab Christian center of Israel. By the way, Christians in the Holy Land. So we talked about the Arabs, Arab percentage in Israel, which is roughly 20% of the Arab, of the population of Israel. 20% of the population of Israel is Arab. Most of the Arab communities that we have here in Israel are actually Arabs. Do you know that? So not all of the Arabs that live in Israel are Muslims. A small percentage of them are Christian. Now, if we take again back the percentages of the population of Israel, roughly one and a half percent of the population is Christian. Most of those, most of this community, Christian community, is Arabic. And then there is also some ethnical minorities, Christian ethnical minorities, like the Maronites, like the Armenians. Those are Christians that are not Arab. But you need to understand that when you are talking, you want to uh, talk about the Christian inside the Holy Land, they will be Arabs, or at least speaking their language will be in Arabic. And this, I'm saying this, because Nazareth is the center of the Christians in Israel. Bethlehem is the center of Christians inside Palestine. This city, Nazareth, that we are entering right now, is the only place in the world, only place in Israel, but there's something very important also in relation with the whole world. Nazareth is the only place in Israel where this Christian community can celebrate much more of their rights. Let's start from the beginning. During the time of uh, the, when the first temple existed in Jerusalem, during the time of Solomon, and later on the prophets, and even at the time of Isaiah, we know that Isaiah calls the whole Galilee region the Galilee of the different nations. And this is because the different nations, foreigners, or as you want to call them, if you want to call them Gentiles, okay, fine. This whole area of the Galilee was not very much populated by Israelites. It was mostly populated by foreigners. Okay, and this will be the place where Jesus would grow up in. Welcome to Nazareth. From here, he will start his ministry. He will come from Nazareth to Cana. And this will take us later on to John chapter 1 and John chapter 2. In John chapter 1, Philip comes to, he visits Cana, and Cana is right over the mountain on the other side, on the northern side of the foot of the Nazarene mountain. Philip go in, goes into Cana and sees Nathaniel that is sitting under the fig tree. And Philip says that we have found the one that the prophecies of we are talking about, Jesus of Nazareth. Nathaniel, what is the answer to him? What good can come out of Nazareth? Because Nazareth was this insignificant town. What good can really come out of Nazareth? I'll tell you what. Today, Nazareth is much bigger than Cana. Cana is only 20,000. The formal name of Cana is actually the village of Cana. And Nazareth is today the center of the Christians in Israel. This is how big it is. So the moment in the Byzantine period, churches were built right here in Nazareth, it became the flower of the gallery. Literally. Yes. 
the rest of the things we're going to talk about the church so the church that we are going to visit um, it commemorates the moment of the annunciation when the angel gabriel announces to mary that she's going to bear and conceive a child literally the fulfillment of the prophecy of isaiah that the light shall shine from the galilee this is the only place where the incarnation of god happened right here and when we are going to enter into the church of the annunciation we are going to see this writing in uh, latin that says here the word became flesh and lived amongst us do you remember the verse from john chapter one the word became flesh and lived amongst us this is the only place and dwelt amongst us this is the only place in nazareth where it says here it became here 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 it became flesh and lived amongst us so this is nazareth i welcome you all to nazareth now besides that this is something that you'll want to write down wake up everybody wake up want to write down write down write it down write it down write it down nazareth nazareth the root of nazareth comes from the word Netzer, which we can translate into descendant or offshoot, which already prophesies in its name the offshoot of David that we will be born right here in Nazareth. Who is the offshoot of David a lot of the times in the prophecy? Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, and that relates to Jesus, the incarnation that happened right here, Jesus that grew up in Nazareth. So, in the name of Nazareth, you can already find this prophecy that talks about the Messiah that will come from here, from Nazareth.